and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games from September 1985. In the second part of our light gun feature, I take a look at the Cheetah Defender. I review some older games. I take a look at a newer title. We visit Type In Corner. We have some more playing tips for you. And we take a look at the demo of the month. But first, the news. After High Street retailers cut the price of the QL last month, Sinclair announced their own price reductions. Originally selling for £399, you can now grab one of these machines for just £199.95. Sinclair say they are simply passing on the manufacturing reduction costs, rather than trying to get rid of stock. A new type of software protection will be released to the public, when it is used to stop pirates from copying Firebird's Elite in September. The system, named Lens Lock, includes a small plastic lens that is held over two scrambled letters displayed on screen. The lens will make this readable and the user then has to enter the characters before playing the game. Firebirds say they will not be using the system for all of their games just yet, but are confident it will cut down pirate coppers. Sinclair have finally reached an agreement with their creditors that will allow them to continue trading in the short term at least. The deal between Sinclair, Barclays, Citibank, Timex, Thorn EMI and AB Electronics is difficult to report on as details have been kept secret. It is thought though that Sinclair will be allowed to trade up to and past the Christmas period, where most of the sales will be, and then the situation will be re-evaluated. The very popular science fiction series V is to be turned into a computer game for several micros, including the Spectrum. The television miniseries proved to be a huge hit, and millions tuned in to watch the battle between Earth and the alien lizard race intent on taking over the planet. Ocean have signed the deal and are working towards a Christmas release. Rumours have been circulating recently about the possibility of a new 16-bit computer from Sinclair. The machine will replace the QL, which was somewhat of a disaster, and if it materialises, will be a competitor for the Atari ST and Commodore Amiga. Digital Research have confirmed they are in talks with the Sinclair about the use of its GEM operating system. GEM, though, would not run on the existing QL due to memory requirements, with the QL having 128K and GEM taking up 103K with a requirement for a further 128K to run applications. This means that the new machine, if there is one, will have to have at least 256K of RAM. The much-typed mega game Bandersnatch has had an interesting journey. Since Imagine went bust in 1984, the rights to the game were bought by Sinclair. They then gave a company called Firelord funding to complete the game, for the QL only. Firelord had amongst its staff former Imagine programmers Ian Hetherington, Dave Lawson and Eugene Evans. Sinclair's funding stopped a few months ago though, and so the game came to a halt yet again. Cygnosis was then formed from the former members of Firelord and took the project on, changing the game title to Bratticus and writing it for the Atari ST. And finally the game got released last week at the Personal Computer World Show. The brand new computer from Sinclair has been launched, but only in Spain. The Sinclair Spectrum 128 has, as you would expect, 128K of memory and expanded sound capabilities, but will not be available in the UK until early 1986. The delay, it is thought, was part of a deal by Sinclair's creditors not to launch anything that could compromise the Christmas sales of the Spectrum Plus. Sinclair have made many concessions to keep trading, including a reduction of staff and board members. From the 13 original members, only 5 will remain, including Nigel Searle. Sir Clive will stay on as non-executive chairman, in charge of research and long-term strategy. And that was the news, and now on to the top-selling games. New into the chart this month is Nightshade by Ultimate Play the Game, another game using the Filmation 2 engine. Way of the Exploding Fist from Melbourne House, a massively popular karate game. Southern Bell from Houston Consultants, a steam train simulator. And Fairlight from The Edge, a 3D adventure game. 
and that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from September 1985. Last month I looked at the Magnum and Sinclair light guns. This month I'm going to see if the Cheetah Defender has the same problems and if any of the games are worth playing. As with last month's feature, because light guns use the raster to get their position information, I had to use my camcorder to film the CRT television, so some of the footage may be a bit rough. On to the gun then, and it definitely feels much more sturdy. More so than the Sinclair and Magnum guns and it's made from a hefty piece of plastic. There's an on off button at the side and an adjustable sight on the top which is a good idea and maybe it'll get round some of those inherent problems that I found with the Magnum and Sinclair versions. There are different versions of this gun for different models of the Spectrum and as mine is for the 48k version I had to break out my old Spectrum Plus. The gun has a single lead that connects to a Kempston compatible joystick interface. Once set up it was time to load some games. The gun comes with six Codemasters games, so I started on side one, and the first game, Bronx Street Cop. Before you begin this game, you have to first go through a shooting range to attain a certain score. And this also helps tune your aim. This is a basic shooting gallery with pop-up targets. Mixed in with the bad guys are old ladies that obviously you shouldn't be shooting. The graphics are fine, but the sound is very limited to just the firing sound, and in fact, the click of the gun trigger was louder than the sound effects, as you can probably hear. Despite trying many, many times, I never reached the required score, and so couldn't proceed. It seemed that my first attempt, when I wasn't filming, was much more forgiving, and any subsequent tries required much more accuracy. Maybe I was mistaken, but this phenomena comes back later too. To get to the next level, I had to cheat a little bit and hold the gun close to the screen. At least I could see the next segment of the game. And here you take to the streets. And again you have things popping up that you have to shoot. Sadly because of the precision issue. As mentioned earlier, this game lasts about 5 seconds and that's it. The gun seems to be built very well and everything worked fine but somehow it was not quite right. And at the time I didn't know it being the first game that I played. I just got more and more frustrated as I tried to get some decent footage. Having decided it was the game that was at fault instead of my accuracy, I loaded the next one, Billy the Kid. This follows the same route as the last game unfortunately, and you first have to go through a round of shooting targets, in this case tins and bottles, before you can move on. I thought the last game was maddening, but at least I could hit a few of these things, unlike this one, which is absolutely impossible. I never hit a single thing. And to prove the game was working, I held the gun to the screen, and even then you had to be pixel perfect to hit anything. By now, over three hours had passed, and I was about to throw the thing out of the window. Why release a game that just doesn't work? or requires far too much accuracy that no one will be able to actually play it. Crazy. Anyway, let's try another game before I go absolutely mad. The next one is Jungle Warfare. It's a kind of Operation Wolf ripoff. You're thrown into the jungle and have to kill everything. There are jeeps, helicopters and various soldiers to hit, and some of them fire back. There's also extra ammo to pick up, and missiles and knives to dodge. As with the first game, my first attempt at this proved good, and I really enjoyed it, and I almost got through to the next level. I had something like a 90% accuracy rating. At last I thought a game that actually works. I set up the video camera and started to film. And this is where the strange behaviour mentioned earlier kicks in. Any subsequent attempts was as though something was wrong. My hit rate went down to something like 10%. 
I was in the same position, the same distance, using the same aiming technique, so what had changed? Anyway, the game has some nice graphics and a much better firing sound than previous games, and I really enjoyed my first play, but it soon got frustrating again. The problem wasn't as bad, but it was still there, which meant I could not progress without cheating and holding the gun up to the screen. Such a pity, as the gun is much better than the Magnum or Sinclair offerings. The games are okay, it's just the calibration, either that or the software requirements for pixel perfect accuracy. That spoils what could have been a great accessory. The gun itself soon slipped into obscurity, despite having Codemasters games. And having used it for nearly four hours, I can actually see why. Seeing a zone of space on your space map, labelled as forbidden, is an open invitation to any wannabe hero. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? This is Executor, released by Ace Software in 1987. Piloting your Mark 7 Quantillion fighter into the zone, you soon find out why the area should be left well alone. But there's no turning back now, and you have to fight on. Yes, it's a shoot 'em up, and a good one too. It follows the usual rules. Fly through a vertically scrolling area, shoot things, collect power-ups, and get as far as you can. The graphics and scrolling are really great and very smooth, very colourful and full of detail. There are a multitude of aliens that swarm about, and not only the landscape to evade, but also the alien cannons. Starting with a simple laser, the game is tricky until you get some power-ups. But it's all too easy to lose them again should you crash into anything or get hit by an alien. Anyone who's watched my shows before will know that I love shoot'em ups. So for me this is a great opportunity to play a game that I hadn't seen before. It took me a while to get into it and I'm still struggling really. The initial level has very little manoeuvring space and it's all about avoiding the enemies and trying to collect power-ups. My initial attempts were poor, and I was lucky if I lasted about 10 seconds, but I still wanted to keep going. After many plays I finally got a little bit further, but it's still a very difficult game to beat. The graphics as mentioned before are great, and the sound works really well. The control is by keyboard or a variety of joysticks, and is responsive. The power-ups range from better weapons, speed-ups, missiles, shields and pods, you know, the usual stuff. The collection method, however, takes a bit of getting used to. Destroying a group of aliens will leave behind a power object, and this power object, when collected, will give you the item on your control panel, to the right. However, if you don't want it, you can opt to wait for a better one, and to do this you simply destroy the power object. The icon on the panel will change to show you what the next power-up will be. Shoot a bunch of aliens and the power object appears again, and if you collect it, you get the power-up. Keeping track of the power-ups can be difficult with so much going on, so my tactic was to grab everything as quickly as possible, otherwise the game won't last very long. There's also end of level boss battles, where you have to destroy the large motherships to go on to the next level. It's all here. I'm bad at these kind of games, but I still love to play it anyway. This is a fine example of the genre too, produced late in the Spectrum's life, and showing the coding skills of that period. The game as it was published contained errors that caused graphic glitches. A fixed version is available on the world of Spectrum. So if you're a fan of this type of game, then it certainly ticks all the boxes, and is highly recommended, even though it is a bit difficult. This is Blade Alley, released by PSS in 1983. Taking your iron-driven interceptor, you dive into the enemy defence trench, with the sole aim of destroying as many enemy craft as possible. Taking its lead from the Death Star scene in Star Wars, this game is a basic 3D shoot 'em up There's no more backstory, just get in and kill stuff. The trench is represented by flashing blocks, 
so there's no real smooth movement. You do get a kind of 3D feeling though, but I suppose it was 1983. Your ship is seen from behind, and the enemy approach from the distance, getting larger as they get closer. Your ship can move up and down as well as left and right, and your laser fires in the appropriate direction, disappearing off into the horizon. Your ship and the enemies have shadows, which is the key to lining up your shots, and if you get it right, it's curtains for the baddie. The continuous sound is fine at first, but it soon gets irritating, but apart from that, sound is used very well, but is only limited to firing and explosions. There are, according to the inlay, six levels, and this being my type of game, I put it to the test, and just about managed to get to the last one. So, after the trench, we're taken to what presumably is the planet surface, and this part reminds me of the book Rogers game. This also brings additional enemies that bounce along the ground. Luckily though, you can't crash into the ground, so hitting these is usually easy. The next level adds an upper level, with small asteroids, at least I think that's what they look like. And then next we have a moving horizon, which works really well. Next it's open space. And then we have what looks like a trench, but without a top or bottom. Again with all the usual aliens flying about. To complete each level, you have to destroy a number of saucers, and these are indicated in the bottom left of your control panel. This means levels can be really quick, if you are good at shooting them, or very long, if you aren't. It also means that if you concentrate on skipping levels, you get a low score, so it's up to you how you want to go about it. Control is by keyboard or joystick, and both are very responsive. And overall, although it's a basic looking game, it isn't too bad. I like it, and it's one of these games that I can load up for a few minutes and blast away. Why not give it a try? It seemed that in the 80s, ninjas were cool, and there were hundreds of games and television shows about them. This is Ninja Master, from Firebird, released in 1986. And yes, it's another in the long line of ninja games. In this game, we try to guide our hero through various challenges to allow him to rise through the ranks and finally become a ninja master. There are four tests in total, complete all four tests and you rise a grade, and it all starts again but with greater difficulty. There are what seems a lot of keys, but luckily you can define them, and the keys are different for each section. The first set are for punching left and right and kicking left and right, and this is for the first section only. The next set of keys are just power left and power right, and these are for the second section. The next set of keys are high, middle and low, and yes, this is for the third section. And finally we have a shoot key, which is for the fourth section. Don't worry if you can't remember them, because the keys are displayed before each level. So let's get on to the first test. And here you have to defend yourself against various projectiles thrown from both sides. You stand in the middle of the screen, and you have to react at the right time. The objects come at you at either shoulder height or ankle height, and pressing the appropriate key sends out an arm or leg to block it. If you get it right, you get a nice yaw effect. If you get it wrong, your man howls in pain. If you strike enough of these objects, it's on to the next test. Here you just have to press the two power keys alternately to build up your power until you have enough to break the piece of wood. This section is very much like Daily Thompson's Decathlon or other running games where you just keep pressing left and right. As you hammer at the keys a little power meter rises and there's a countdown. If you've got enough power, when the counter reaches zero, your man can smash the piece of wood. Get this right and it's on to the next test. And here we have objects thrown at you from the right hand side. They can be either high, middle or low, and you have to press the appropriate key to block them. 
some of these objects move quite fast, and this is the part of the game that is most tricky. In fact, I tried it so many times and never actually got past this, so to see the final stage I had to load up the RZX. And here you have a ninja with a gun that has to shoot tin cans. Obvious ninja training there. The graphics are okay, although the animation is a bit jerky with only really two positions per action. Colour is used well throughout the game and it looks good with a large well drawn ninja. There's a tune at the start of the game and before each level, but the in game sound is limited to either the ya or ah sounds. Well there is the sound of the crowd, but that's just a lot of noise. The best sound effect is the wooden block being broken, there's a nice thud there. Playability, well, there's not much of a story, not much progression apart from the repeated four levels, and at the end of the day it's just a reaction test. It's fine to play for about 30 minutes or so, to see how far you can get, and without emulation I suppose the multi-load system can soon become annoying. Enjoyable at first then, but there is little skill in progressing, you just need fast reflexes. This is Flynn's Adventures in Bombland, released by Tom Dolby in 2001. I expect most people have played Bomberman in one form or another. The classic strategy maze bomber up was originally released by Hudson Soft in 1983, and has gone on to spawn well over 70 versions across nearly all gaming platforms. This then is arguably the best version for the Spectrum. There is a plot, something about rescuing friends. But did anyone ever play attention to this? I don't think so. So the game at heart is just level after level of maze bombing action. The idea, for those who have never played this type of game, is quite simple. Drop the bombs to destroy the enemy, blow up blocks, reveal extra points and bonuses, and find the exit. And of course, don't die. By timing your bomb drops and trying to anticipate the enemy movement, you can successfully clear them off the screen. But you have to be careful. It's all too easy to blow yourself up, or get yourself trapped, whilst trying to drop a bomb at the right point. The bomb explodes outwards in a cross pattern, so you can hide behind certain blocks once you get used to it. Each level has a time limit slowly ticking away, so you have to get a move on. And if you get lucky and clear all the enemies quickly, you at least have some time to go around and blow up some blocks trying to find the bonuses. As the levels move on, things get harder with more enemies and faster enemies. But you can have a sort of power-up. By picking up the Scion Heart bomb symbol, you can get bombs that you can control. Dropping them leaves them in place, and you can trigger their explosion by pressing the space key. A very handy tool, but it only lasts for the level. If you manage to survive the first stage, it's on to the next one, with a graphics change, and here we have a nice green maze, with different enemies. Another thing you have to watch out for is blowing up the exit. It doesn't destroy it, but it sends the monsters into overdrive and slows you down, so it's not a good thing to do. The graphics, as you can see, are really nice and well drawn, and well animated. They're easy to see, and very smooth. Control is by keyboard or various joysticks, and is very responsive. Sound is minimal, but functional and works well for this game. The gameplay is brilliant and very addictive, classic Bomberman style, with plenty of fast and furious action. This is definitely recommended. Welcome to Type In Corner, revealing the games not seen in over 20 years. This month's game is Outlander, written by Lawrence Herniman and published in a February 1983 edition of Popular Computing Weekly. The game was sent to the show by Dave Corbett. Thanks Dave. The listing was a single page of BASIC, and contained the game's instructions and keys to use. The idea is that you have to guide your spaceship around the landscape, drop bombs on the buildings, and then land on the landing pad. 
The problem is, you'll have a limited amount of fuel to do this, but luckily unlimited bombs. The movement is in character squares, which can be a little tricky, and the controls can be a bit sluggish. If you manage to clear the first stage, you get to play it again. Clear that one, and you get onto a second stage, which is much harder. The landscape is nice, and uses the draw command rather than blocks that some early games used. This gives the game a more professional look, but being in basic, it's slow to draw. Graphics are UDGs, that's user definable graphics, to anyone who doesn't know, and the sound consists of bleeps for movement, firing and explosions. It's a simple and nice game, and something different than the usual games found in type-ins, and it's good for a few plays, at the very least. But once you've managed to conquer all the levels, it just keeps repeating, so it loses the challenge. But other than that, not bad for a typing game, especially for 1983. This game has not been seen since it was first published, and it will be available from my blog to download very shortly. Why not give it a try? Playing tips, we're going to take a look at Jet Set Willy. As with Alienate, I can't go through the entire game, but what I thought I'd do is have a look at some of the rooms near to the start that are quite difficult. So I'll have a look at some of the difficult rooms, probably the most difficult room in Jet Set Willy, the Banyan Tree, the Nightmare Room, which I must admit, until I actually worked out how to do it recently for this section, I always thought was a real, real nightmare, and and the main stairway, which again, I always thought was a bit of a pain. So first up, we have the Banyan Tree. And the secret to the Banyan Tree is to get onto the second platform in a way that neither of the baddies can either side can get you. And if you do that and you're lined up exactly right, they won't be able to. The blue rotating microchip and the pig devil won't be able to get you. So jump across to it and then line yourself up and quickly turn around and line up again. Then to get past the pig devil, you've got to do pixel perfect jump. Almost clip his ear and jump over and then you've done it. Congratulations. If you can do the Banyan Tree, took me a lot of goes to do it to get this recording but what I would say is you don't need to get from left to right to go complete Jet Set Willy. It's actually quite easy to get from the Nightmare Room which is on the right of the Banyan Tree to the Swimming Pool which is on the left without going through this room. It's simply not needed to be done so the real tip for this game is don't even attempt it. Don't go through the Banyan Tree. There's no point in doing it. Next up we have the Nightmare Room, and what you do in the Nightmare Room is enter from the left hand side and you want to jump under the first Maria, over the second, then a long jump under the first in the Maria, and land on that platform and quickly get your wings vertical. You're then safe to jump over to the next platform and grab the object. Then turn around and move back a bit, and that purple Maria, you want to jump under her and onto the platform to her left at the bottom from the position you're in at the moment. And that's it, you've done the Nightmare Room. Finally, we have the main stairway. Start in the ballroom to the west, and move through and jump through the stair and then move back to the right so that you miss the rotating coin as it comes back across. Then follow that and jump onto the second platform. And when the coin goes back past, jump onto the moving platform and keep your finger on left and jump and jump over again and you can collect the first object. Then you have to wait for a little bit. You can't jump on the first time the yellow enemy at the top comes across, you've got to wait for the third. So jump, and jump again, and if you wait till the third, the egg will have rolled past you, so you can jump down off that platform, walk along, and jump up and get the second object. Easy when you know how. So there we have some playing tips for Jet Set Willy. I hope you found those useful. Obviously it's not tips for the full game, but for some of the screens near the start of the game. Until next time, bye! It's time for my demo of the month. 
and this month's demo is Micro by Jemba Boys, released in 2014. The countdown shows the amount of time left, and we go straight into a nicely drawn intro. The majority of the demo consists of some impressive filled vectors, some of them mimicking light source renders. They spin very smoothly, and are presented in a great way, with some nice top and bottom border art. Other sections in the demo are normal vectors, again very smooth. There's also another hard to describe effect. If it was on an Amiga, I would say it was a blitter effect, but it's still impressive. The music suits the demo really well too. It's just a pity that it doesn't last very long. And at the end, we're left with a nice image to look at before the thing starts again. A really nice demo that has some very smooth vector work, and well worth checking out. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.